Good morning everyone and once again welcome here to Trinent Parish Church for our service for the third Sunday in Lent and I give you on behalf of the congregation and for those who are watching beyond Trinent itself a very warm welcome. Some intimations we have on a Wednesday evening a Zoom prayer time and you need to contact Murdo for that and Murdo's telephone number is 898-689 and the prayer time takes place normally from about 7.15 and for about 40 minutes. And on a Thursday morning, Marion Skinner invites you to a coffee time by telephone and from 10.30 and you need to contact Marion on 612-425. We do have a daily reflection that's uploaded uh, each day, um, so please uh, join us for that. And on a Wednesday, I do an evening reflection as well. And I thank everybody who takes part in making sure that is possible. I want to give a thanks especially to Laurie and to Connor and all those that take part just to make this service and everything that we do at the moment to reach to you um, uh, it's a big thank you it takes a lot of work and preparation and of course of their time so friends our call to worship this morning based on Psalm 119 the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Teach, O Lord, to follow your decrees, then I will keep them to the end. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight and turn my heart to you and to your word. Friends, we have a short clip based on Psalm 19. perfect converting the soul the testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple the statues of the Lord are right rejoicing the heart Judgments of the Lord are true and righteous all together. More to be desired are they than gold, yet and much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honey. Moreover by them your servant is warned And in keeping them there is great reward The law of the Lord is perfect Converting the soul The testimony of the Lord is sure Statues of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord. 
Friends, our first hymn this morning um, is from Mission Praise. Uh, it's a new commandment. a response, we will rejoice in it. 
This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We rejoice that we can come today to worship you, Father, on telly, online, or in the silence of our hearts from our homes this morning. But we rejoice that soon we will be able to worship again in our church as the whole family of God. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, keep us patient and vigilant as we await the easing of lockdown in the days ahead. Keep us patient in all things, for this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Father, we rejoice that vaccines have been developed and the vaccination program is well underway here in Scotland and throughout the United Kingdom with a high uptake. Help those who are reluctant to come forward to help in the fight against this virus. And help us to do our part in helping the third world countries to get vaccines to eradicate this plague. For this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Father, we do rejoice that hospital admissions and ICU numbers are falling. But we pray for healing and wholeness for all who are ill. For this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The number of deaths has reduced, but many still mourn, Father. Bring them your comfort and your peace, Lord. For this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Loving Father, you are our strength and our shield. You are our miracle worker, our promise keeper, and our light in the darkness. For this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Loving and healing God, draw close to us in this pandemic crisis and let us feel your healing, your loving and gracious presence. Keep us strong and with your help we will defeat this virus. For this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And we share together saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever. Amen. Friends, we have a short clip of Kiri Elysian. Once again, we have our family time, friends, and I once again invite Debbie to share with, her, with us all this morning her message to us, and this will be followed by a hymn very much build up, and there are actions there. Spring is just around the corner. It's such a wonderful time of the year. 
The temperature begins to warm and the world begins to take on a fresh new look. The trees start to put on leaves, the grass begins to turn green and the flowers start to bloom. Has anybody noticed any snowdrops or crocuses begin to come through the ground now? Everything is beautiful. There are things that tell us that spring is here too. For one thing, many people have started their spring cleaning. Look at this stuff that I've got this morning. I've got my, my window cleaner, got my polish, got my dusters. It looks like I'm getting ready to clean the house. Do your adults ever do any spring cleaning? Spring's a good time to give your house a good going over and clean everything up and get rid of any junk that you don't need. This morning, I want to tell you about a time when Jesus did some spring cleaning. It was time for the annual Passover celebration, so Jesus travelled to Jerusalem. When he arrived in Jerusalem, Jesus went to the temple. He couldn't believe his eyes. There in the temple area, he saw people who were selling cattle, sheep and doves for the people to use as sacrifices in the temple. There were tables set up for money changers so that people could change their money to pay their temple taxes. It looked like a carnival rather than a house of worship. Jesus did not like what he saw. He was so angry he made a whip from some rope and he drove the cattle and the sheep and those who were selling them from the temple. He went to the tables of the money changers and turned them over, scattering coins all over the temple floor. To the ones who were selling the doves, he says, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? Yes, I would say that Jesus did some spring cleaning in the temple that day. As we think about Jesus cleansing the temple, we should also think about some other cleaning that needs to be done. We're in a season called Lent. At first the word Lent meant the season of spring, but it has now become much more than that. It is a time to look inside ourselves and see if there's anything in us that needs to be changed. Are there some areas of your life that Jesus needs to do some spring cleaning in? I know there are in mine. Let's say a wee prayer together. You can close your eyes if you want to and join in at the end with Amen. Dear Jesus, during this time when we think of spring cleaning, we ask you to forgive us when we do wrong and to make us clean. Amen. Thank you, Debbie.
Our readings this morning by Connor come from 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18. And our gospel this morning comes from John chapter 2 from verse 13 to 22. Good morning everybody. Our first reading this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 18 to 25. The wisdom of God. The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God, as the scriptures say. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars and the world's brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish. Since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom, he, he has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven. It is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended and the Gentiles say it is all nonsense. But to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. This foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans, and God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Our second reading this morning comes from John chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. Jesus clears the temple. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration, so Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple area he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and the cattle, scattered the money changers' coins over the floor and turned over their tables. Then going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Then his disciples remembered this prophecy from the scriptures. Passion for God's house will consume me. But the Jewish leaders demanded, what are you doing? If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. All right, Jesus replied, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. What, they explained, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you can rebuild it in three days. But when Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this, and they believed both the scriptures and what Jesus had said. Amen. And thanks be to God for these readings of his most holy word, and to his name be all praise and glory. Our hymn. I have brought you out of Egypt.
Friends, our next hymn is from Mission Praise, When We Walk with the Lord. Bless thou, Father, the words of my lips and the meditation of our hearts, that they may be a profit and acceptable to thee, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The story, friends, of Jesus cleansing the temple with a whip reminds me of the old Eastern story about a snake that lived on a path on a very famous temple in India. Many people would walk along the path on their way to worship and the snake would often bite the folk with his poisonous bite. I wonder if that's making you kind of slither at the moment and squirm. One time a swami was on his way to the temple and the snake jumped out to bite him. But before the snake could bite him, The Swami put the snake into a trance, 
and order him to stop biting, to biting the folk. And of course it was there, the psalmist says to him, it's not right, you know, to go and bite people with your poisonous bite. So from now on, you shall not bite anyone. You have to stop doing it. So a few months went on. And once again the Swami was passing. And again, of course, he noticed the snake was lying there in the grass at the side of the path. But this time, the poor snake was all cut and all bruised. And he was in an offy state. And Swami says to him, what's happened to you, my friend? And of course, since you have put your spell on me, the snake explained, I have been unable to defend myself. Give me back my bite, friends, please. Give it back to me. And the Swami says to him, you foolish snake. When I told you not to bite anyone, I never said that you couldn't hiss. And so, friends, to our gospel reading today, we see an angry Jesus. And it's rather refreshing since we're so used to thinking of Jesus being this, like the hymn, Jesus is gentle, is meek and mild, as all the old hymns would describe him. If Jesus did not occasionally take a bite in the passage, he surely hissed here, didn't he? And the question that we should ask about this passage this morning, why did Jesus get so angry? What happened? What happened there in the temple to provoke this rather startling reaction of our Lord? What was that very catalyst? For we read very much in the passage from John today, takes place at the time of the Passover of the Jews. And in the Niv reading, if you were to read that, the Jewish Passover doesn't quite capture the essence of them and us, which is the true import of the phrase. For the Passover festival was derived from an episode in Egypt. It was of enormous importance for the Jews in their understanding of identity and their faith. It was the most significant festival in the temple, the most important holy place that Jesus decided to carry out this very visual and, of course, high-profile attack. In all four Gospels, the story of the cleansing of the temple in Matthew and Mark and in Luke, but the synoptics himself place it near the end of Jesus' life. Whereas in the gospel this morning, places that the cleansing at the beginning of our Lord's ministry. So why does John put it right at the start? Firstly, we need to remember that the gospel writers chronologically was a little importance in comparison to the theological message, which they were intending to convey to you and I. But John wants to make his gospel about Jesus as a fulfillment of the religion of the Jews. Hence the phrase such as Passover of the Jews. The point being, of course, that Christians no longer had need of such a festival. The Passover has been fulfilled in Jesus. The incident takes place at Passover, a time of death and sacrifice, because it's a time of the death of Jesus which brings the need for a Passover to an end. Humankind would no longer need to purge guilt by placing onto animals the blame of their own sins. So here John wanted to establish right at the start of his writing what Jesus was all about. He represented the old of the old order and the beginning of what was to be new. So it is that John starts his gospel by showing that Jesus brings a new order a new transformation of religion and a time when sacrificial worship is brought to an end. The death of Jesus brings death itself to an end for Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise of God. He's about nothing less than the complete reconstitution of the worship of Israel 
around himself. For in time the temple will become redundant, it will have no more purpose, and it will be completely obsolete. Rather, the body of Jesus, which is the temple itself. It may well be that some of the trading which was going on in the temple precincts was totally inappropriate. But we miss the point of this episode if we think that this is what Jesus was so angry about. Jesus takes on the opposition fearlessly and his actions are recalled to the disciples of the passage a way back from the Old Testament. In Psalm 69, zeal for thy house consume me. Friends, make no mistake. Jesus did not have the zeal because he was on a mission to stop corruption. He has a much bigger target than that. Jesus is not involved in a clean-up exercise. He wants nothing less than an end to the Jewish religion itself. Historians will note, and it's important, that the Jews said to Jesus, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, as we read in verse 20. Construction began under Herod the Great in 20 or 19 B.C., which means that Jesus' cleansing of the temple takes place in 27 or 28 AD. The majority of the work on the temple has been completed by this time, but the re refinements will continue until 63 AD, only seven years before the Romans will destroy it. Incidentally, John mentions three distinct Passovers in his Gospel which leads us to believe that the ministry of Jesus lasted three years. In John 2.13, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And in chapter 6, verse 4, the Jewish Passover festival was near. And finally in 11, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up from the country to Jerusalem for the ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. So here we are reading, and here we are picking up. But today, we hear of Jesus being angry. The anger that Jesus felt that the day grew out of his love for his Father, and the love for the people that he saw in the temple, and importantly, a concern for what their worship had come to mean. And it is because of the intensity of that passion that we see Jesus so stirred up. He was so fired up. Jesus has just performed his first miracle at the wedding of Cana, where he turned water into wine. In fact, John doesn't call it a miracle. He calls it Jesus' miracle signs. There are signs that God is doing something new. A new age is beginning, beginning to dawn in the world of the time. They are signs that the Messiah has come and that God is about to reveal his glory and do some very powerful things as he demonstrates his love. They are signs that the new order has come to replace the old. The signs that things will never, ever be the same again. In Jesus' first interaction with the public, as John records it in his gospel, takes place in the temple. He causes such a furor and the people question his messianic authority and ask for a sign. But here the sign that Jesus gives is a prediction of his own suffering, his own death and finally his resurrection. Can you visualize that scene? He's entered the temple the courtyard, and of course it looks like a marketplace crowded with folk selling and buying and the money changing hands. As Jesus watches all this, he's absolutely outraged and he takes his whip for, from some rope and drives out the animals from the courtyard, overturns every table, sending coins flying. It's such a picturesque scene. Get these things out of here, he says, he shouts. This is a place of prayer. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? 
A while ago we heard, of course, the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. And reading on this occasion, Jesus doesn't get red hot about adultery, does he? He doesn't get mad because people in the temple were stealing. He doesn't get furious at all of the covetousness or the lack of respect for parents. What he does get angry at, he attacked their worship. He assaulted their religion. He isn't attacking the Pharisees for their religion or the scribes for their snobbishness. He isn't assaulting unbelievers. He is attacking the very believers. He barges in. He attacks the religious for their religion, the way that they have perverted the worship of God. John quite deliberately places this story in chapter 2 of his gospel because a new thing is breaking into the world. The temple with its sacrifices and superficial worship had their day. Their day. It's past. It's over. Jesus explains in this way to the Samaritan woman, Believe me, the time is coming when you won't worship the Father either on this mountain or in Jerusalem, he says. The time is coming, and it's already here. True worship will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is looking for anyone who will worship him that way. God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship in the spirit and truth. As quoted in John chapter 4. Aren't we in this season of Lent? And it's a time for a self-examination. Jesus cleansing the temple leads us to ask ourselves, does our worship need cleansing? Does it need renewing? What does this sign say to us about how we worship? How our attitude towards worship happens? This is the text that leads the religious to examine their religion. We're supposed to come here to meet God when we actually physically can get back into our buildings. To spend time with God. But you can do that in your kitchen this morning. Be touched by God and to be healed by Him. We're supposed to come to recall the great things that God has done daily in our lives over the past week, past months. And give that thanksgiving. God has rescued us from the slavery of sin and given us a new land, a new home in heaven, forever with him. We are supposed to be here to let God, who loves us, touch our lives in his word and sacrament. Assure us of his love and send us back into the world so that you and I make a difference. We are supposed to come with our fellow Christians and be strengthened, be reassured in the presence that we are loved and supported and importantly comforted. And all very well in normal times. We would normally get out of bed, get dressed, sit in our seat or in our pew, sing our hymns and our songs, fight to keep focused on the sermon, stand for the benediction, have a cup of tea or coffee afterwards and go home. But this morning or this afternoon or wherever you are, you're in your home watching and listening to me. When Jesus saw what people had done with worship, life in the temple, he was horrified. It made him mad. Just so mad that when he saw what had happened to worship in the temple, the terrible attitudes of those that were worshipping. Jesus looks into the temple of our hearts when we worship. Is he also horrified about the way we approach that? When he looks into our hearts, does he see our reluctance to be here, driven by our conscience, barely participating? Glad it's all over when the last amen is said. Are we so busy? that out of our 160 hours in a week, we can't willingly spare just one hour to come into God's presence, especially with our fellow believers, and celebrate God's love. Remember, friends, Paul's picture of the church as a body. 
Every part of the body works together, even in worship. And besides, God comes to us in his word and sacraments, regardless of what kind of music we might have, or what style of our liturgy, or what level of understanding we have about what worship is all about. Jesus cleaned out everything that didn't belong in the temple. He cleans everything that doesn't belong in our lives, and especially including our worship lives, as we listen today, wherever we might be. He gave his body and his blood for all the insincerity in our worship, the times that we have driven to worship by conscience, but our hearts were not there. For all the times that we have spoken the words and, of course, not meant them. He has given us his body and his blood for the times that we have sat and gone home untouched by what we have heard. For the times that we have given something else a higher priority than coming into God's presence. I thank you for sharing this time with us this morning. But we thank God that he is still cleansing his temple. That temple in our hearts today. We are made clean by the blood of the Lamb. Invited to come and stand in his presence with reverence and awe. And friends, he touches your hearts. He's with you every moment. Father, we wish for the day that we are able to come back and share together in a time of love together. And as the vaccine is rolled out and we know that in time that we can share together back in our home church here in Trinent and wherever we may be watching ourselves, in our own home church, wherever that might be. But we thank you for the message this morning. Place it on our hearts, knowing that our Lord is with us at all times. Amen. Friends, let us pray. We have our prayers for others. Truth be told, Jesus, there are lots of tables that need overturning in our lives. Beneath the veer of respectability, the tidy rows, and of course the neat reg regulations, hide dark addictions and angry judgments, hungry greeds, heartless rejections. We know the pain, and so do those around us, Father, of keeping up the facade. Father, what a relief it would be to have it all upset, smashed and scattered and destroyed. So perhaps today, Jesus, you could pay us a visit and help us to radically rearrange the furniture of our lives. Holy God, in Jesus Christ you have built us an eternal house a temple of righteousness, a place of gracious plenty for the hungry, an abundant life for the poor in spirit. Fill us, Father, with zeal for the body of Christ. Overturn the tables, corruption of greed, and upset the imbalance of injustice, so that we may worship you, Father, in truth and in spirit. Through Jesus Christ, who is risen very much indeed. Amen. Friends, we have the bright cloud and the bright glory as our next hymn.
friends, we end our service this morning with the blessing. May the God of wisdom guard your ways and guide your paths. May the living God of truth enlighten your hearts and open your minds. And may the Spirit of God give you life and life to the full. And the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love this day and beyond. Amen. And our closing hymn, Focus My Eyes on You, O Lord. Amen. Thank you.